In this video, we'll be going over some of the best spells you can pick up with a second level spell slot, either for its utility use, but sometimes because of its damage potential. And at number 10, we have Lesser Restoration. What this spell does is pretty simple. By touching a creature, you can end one disease or one condition affecting them. If you choose a condition, it can be the Blinded, Deafened, Paralyzed, or Poison condition. This spell is open to most spellcasters, at least the support types, and is very useful for any support. Simply because it can be common for someone to get at least one of these conditions. And most of these can be quite troublesome, especially ones that last a long time or could maybe even kill you, like being affected by a Gaspor's Death Burst ability. A fun thing to note is that if you have a party that is a bit too adventurous, this spell can be used to remove STDs or cure drunkenness in case your party dwarf or bard makes some bad decisions. And at number 9, we have Heat Metal. How this spell works is when casting the spell, you choose a metal object and then heat it up. Now, RP-wise, this could be anything, so if your DM lets you, you could use this to boil water in a pot with no fire. But its main use is to choose a set of medium armor, a heavy armor, or a weapon that is made of metal. The metal then begins to heat up, and any creature in physical contact with that metal takes 2d8 fire damage when you first cast the spell. So if they are holding a weapon or wearing armor, they will take that damage. After that, you can use a bonus action each turn to do that damage again, until of course the minute ends or your concentration breaks. The creature wearing or holding the metal object takes the damage no matter what, and if it can drop the item, it automatically drops it, unless they succeed a constitution saving throw. They can keep holding the item, but until the start of the caster's next turn, they have disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks while holding that heated metal. Which basically means they ain't hitting nobody with that weapon unless they get really lucky. So if you're fighting someone who's wielding a powerful weapon or some sort of metal object you want to take, you can force them to drop it using this, and then grab it and run, among other things. But the biggest use is casting this on enemies who are wearing metal armor, as removing medium and heavy armor takes quite a while. There is no chance the enemy can get rid of this damage, so their only hope is to interrupt your spellcasting. And since you can reactivate it every turn as a bonus action, you can simply cast Heat Metal, stand back, and every turn use your normal action for something else. Then reactivate for even more damage, cooking your enemies alive. As long as you can keep a distance, you can easily make yourself a cooked foe. And at number 8, we have Zone of Truth. Lack someone with really good insight? Have someone need to question who you don't trust to not swindle you with their expertise in lying? Well, Zone of Truth is the spell for you. With a range of 60 feet, a duration of 10 minutes, when you cast a spell, you create a 15-foot radius spear on a point of your choice within range. Until the spell ends, a creature that enters a spell for the first time on a turn, or starts its turn there, needs to make a charisma saving throw. Upon failing the save, the creature can't speak a deliberate lie while in the circle and the caster of the circle knows if an enemy fails or succeeds the saving throw. So absolutely no way for the person you're questioning to sneak their way out. A creature affected by the spell knows the spell is affecting them, and thus can choose to avoid answering questions if it would normally respond with a lie. And so a creature can try to be evasive in answering questions as long as it's in the radius. This spell does not force people to speak, but it does force them to tell the truth. This spell is amazing for interrogations and questions, to make sure someone is telling the truth without having to rely on those pesky insight rolls, which might not even tell you if they're lying or not, since by rules as written, insight is not a lie detector. But lots of tables homebrew it to be one. This spell is actually a lie detector though, or at least a truth maker. Just remember, if you're trying to interrogate to not step into the zone yourself, otherwise you won't be able to lie either. Although, I guess you could use it as a way to prove yourself truthful to someone, or even trick them if you succeed the check and they won't know that you can lie. And at number 7, we have Locate Animals or Plants and Locate Object. While there's also a Locate Creature spell, this spell is a 4th level, so we won't be talking about that. Anyways, these two spells both generally do the same thing, but have overall very different effects. Both of them locate a specific thing within a large radius. First, we go over Locate Object. This spell has you describe or name an object you're familiar with, meaning you were within 30 feet of it at least once and could see it, and for the duration, you can sense the direction of that object, as long as it's within 1,000 feet of you. And if it is moving, you know the direction it's moving. I'm sure you could see how this could be useful. Has a thief just ran off with your coin purse? Target your coin purse and give chase. Your wizard been kidnapped? Target his spell book and you are sure to find where he's being held. You can also specify things of specific kinds, 
say, the nearest jeweled necklace or a closest bit of a specific furniture, tool, or weapon. You can even use this to track down hidden artifacts or lost treasures. Locate animals or plants works pretty much the same. However, it only allows you to specify a specific species of beast or plant. This allows you to lure the direction and distance to the nearest target of that kind within 5 miles. This can be quite useful overall in many circumstances. Need to find one rare kind of creature or plant for a quest, or is being hidden? Low on food and need to find a nearby pack of deer to hunt? Maybe you're trying to save a sick NPC or create a special potion and need to find a rare herb? Well, what if you're walking through the woods and want to make sure there's no bears, wolves, or other feral beasts nearby? All of that is a great use for this spell, especially since it can be ritual cast. Meaning if you have the time, you can use it again and again as needed without a spell slot, simply at the cost of 10 minutes. And at number 6, we have Crown of Madness. When you cast this spell, you can choose a humanoid within range, and they must make a wisdom saving throw or become charmed for the duration. It is very obvious that they are being controlled as their eyes change color and jagged iron crowns appear on their head. So you can't really use this secretly. The charmed creature must use its action to make a melee attack on a creature of your choice each turn, or be unable to move until after it attacks. And the creature can act on its own if you choose no creature, or if there's no creatures in its range. On each turn after the first turn, you must use your action to keep control, or the spell instantly ends. However, the target can also take a wisdom save every turn to try and end the effect early. Now, an interesting thing to note. Unlike a lot of other charm effects, it does not break or activate a save on taking damage. Meaning, this ability is good for one major thing. Controlling enemies to attack other enemies. This spell can be very powerful when used against powerful melee enemies with low wisdom. Because it simultaneously does two powerful things. One, it removes an enemy from the fight. And two, gives you potentially extra damage for the battle if used on a big target. In card games, the ability to take control of your opponent's cards, even temporarily, is very powerful, and it's just as good in D&D as well. That's why probably the biggest limiting factor to this ability is that it only works on humanoid targets. And at number 5, we have the Immovable Object spell. This spell is from the Explorer's Guide to Wild Mountain is for Konergy Wizards, but can be used by any spellcaster with a DM's approval. So just keep that in mind before we go into this. Everybody likes the immovable rod, but how about we turn any and every item into one? Holding an object that weighs no more than 10 pounds, you can cause it to become magically stuck in place, and you and any creatures you designate can move the object normally, or you could even set a password that suppresses the spell's effect for one minute if spoken within five feet. While fixated in the air, the item can hold up to 4,000 pounds of weight, falling if there's more, and a creature can make a strength check against your spell save DC to try to move it, allowing them to move it up to 10 feet on a success. So now, what are some uses for this? Well, let's go over a few. Placing an item behind a door to act as a doorstop is a pretty simple application. However, a thing to note about this spell is a lack of a saving throw, attack roll, or restriction on worn or carried items. So, if you're in melee range of an enemy, you can basically cast this on any items of theirs that you can touch that is less than 10 pounds to basically force them to abandon that object. Usually, most armor is too heavy to target except for two of them, and something as light as a shirt can be taken off easily. But you can target almost all weapons, shoes, a light t-shirt, or leather and padded armor, as both are 10 pounds or lighter. And only a handful of weapons weigh more than 10 pounds. So unless they have a pike or a heavy crossbow, everything else is a viable target. Also, remember, there's no concentration or rolls involved to do this, so it's pretty situational targeted control. Or something else fun to mention. Do you find yourself in a large valley that you need to cross? A roll of cloth can be attached to an arrow like a rope and fired across a large gap. Then you can cast a spell on it. Even though it's very long and wide, you can still make the cloth into a path that can hold 4,000 pounds. That way, you can shimmy across. Although, this might be stretching the limits of the spell a bit. Do you want to keep someone from getting away? You put something on them, like a pair of manacles, and then cast a spell on that. Or, the more evil route? Get a small object, like a pebble, cast the spell on it, then speak the command word so it temporarily loses the huge amount of weight, and then force feed it to a person, wait 5 minutes, and suddenly they're stuck for the remaining 55 minutes. Any movement would press against them from the inside. This spell's limits are basically just your imagination, and made even more powerful when you cast it at higher levels, 
which can make it heavier or even a permanent cast if used with a 6th level or higher spell slot. The only real downside to this spell is the 25 gold cost per use, which could be insignificant or a deal breaker based on your campaign. There's a reason this spell says in its spell description that it requires your DM's approval to even take it, because there seems to be a few oversights with how useful it can be with just its rules as written. And at number 4, we have Pass Without Trace. We all know those issues of a group stealth checks trying to sneak by guards or ambush a bandit camp, but the danged fighter in any of their heavy armor or the ranger in their scale mail have disadvantage on their stealth checks, as the clapping of their AC alerts the guards. So how do you counter that? Well, by casting Pass Without Trace. Lasting for up to an hour with concentration, it creates a veil of shadows that causes silence to radiate from you, masking you and each creature you choose within 30 feet of you, concealing yourself, of course, to gain a plus 10 to their stealth dexterity checks, while also making you and your allies immune to being tracked, except by magical means. No tracks to track or traces to trace. As mentioned before, this is a great way to get through a group stealth check. Even if your party is full of people with low dexterity and horribly loud armor and gear because of how great a plus 10 is, even if they have disadvantage on those stealth checks. It's also a great way to divert people from trying to track you. Again, as long as they don't have a way to magically track you. But with how useful stealth is in most settings and games, this is definitely an A tier spell to pick up. Or for at least one person in your party to have. And at number 3, we have Prayer of Healing. This spell is rather simple, 10 minute cast time, 30 foot range, and is usable by clerics and paladins. Because of its 10 minute cast time, this is something you almost never want to use in combat. However, its effects are far too good to pass up, being by far the most efficient healing spell for its level. And how so? Well, it heals up to 6 creatures of your choice that you can see within range, and each creature heals for 2d8 plus your spell casting modifier. The only downside being is it does not work on undeads or constructs. But let's compare it to a spell like Cure Wounds, a first level spell that heals. This ability heals one creature that is not undead or a construct for 1d8 plus your spell mod. So at the cost of a one higher level spell slot and a 10 minute cast time, you now heal not only up to 6 times more targets, you now also heal them for 2d8 plus spell mod instead of 1d8 plus spell mod. Of course Cure Wounds is still good for its instant healing. The simple raw healing energy of Prayer of Healing is undeniable and as long as you have the time after combat, you can quickly give your entire party a health boost countered by no other spell for a fair few levels. You can even increase the level of healing by 1d8 for each spell slot level used. Again, for example, maxing out at a bonus of 68 worth of healing, compared to something like Cure Wounds at higher levels only increasing by 1d8 each level as well. Of course, how much a first level spell slot is worth compared to a second level is debatable, but rarely can one dish out 10 times more healing with a single spell slot increase. And at number 2, we have Silence. This spell is super simple. First off, it's a ritual, so you can cast it as you wish, when you wish, simply at the cost of 10 minutes of your time, or as one action if you want to cast it instantly at the cost of a spell slot. This spell has one simple effect. It creates a 20-foot radius spear of absolute silence. But what this accomplishes is a few things, so let's go over it. First off, no sound can be created within the 20 foot radius sphere, and no sound can pass through it. Any creature or object full in the area is immune to thunder damage, any creature inside is treated as deafened, and lastly, anyone within the radius cannot cast spells that require a verbal component. So what are the uses for this? Well, the coolest use is you can cast onto a group of enemy spellcasters, forcing them to stop casting since a vast majority of spells require a verbal component to cast. And if they simply don't have the movement to get out of the radius that turn, do not have non-verbal spells, or are trapped inside of a room, they are left to do literally nothing other than panic because they can't use most of their spells. And they can't even call it to their allies to target the person channeling the silent spell. Another use is in case you need to do something very loud and don't want to alert literally everyone in the vicinity. And another example would be fighting an enemy who uses mostly thunder-based attacks. And while it limits what you and your party can do, making you and everyone in a 20 foot radius immune to enemies major damage type can be quite powerful for a second level spell. And again, this spell can be cast as a ritual, so you can save a spell slot by performing a ritual version of the silence to do these things, as long as you have the spare time to do it before combat. Casting silence onto a group of bandits all around a fire as an opening move of an ambush is a pretty amazing way to start a panic. Those bandits won't be able to communicate, and won't be able to understand what the heck is happening, or hear the rogue rushing them from behind even. And as an honorable mention, Healing Spirit. 
This one could have easily have been number one and been far above every other spell on this list. But this spell was nerfed, as its original version summoned a spirit that could last for up to a minute and healed anyone who stepped into it. So, a full party could just take turns hopping in and out of the spirit for a full minute to heal rather easily out of combat with only a second level spell slot. However, it was a Rothard to only be able to heal a specific amount of times instead of an unlimited amount, being one plus your spellcasting modifier. This changed the spell from being quite possibly the most broken spell in the game to a rather meh healing spell. And at number one, we have Spike Growth. Spike Growth is a spell with a couple of parts. First being, you select a point within range that creates a 20 foot radius of hard spikes and thorns. That circle of area becomes difficult terrain for the duration of the spell, having speed through the area. And when a creature enters the area, or while within it, they take 2d4 piercing damage for every 5 feet they travel. So to get from one side to the other, a creature would take 16d4 worth of piercing damage. However, the transformation of the ground looks natural, meaning it will not look out of the ordinary, be it a moss or vines or a bit of bristle. Which means that a creature that did not see the spell being cast must make a wisdom perception check against your spell save DC to recognize the terrain as dangerous. Even if they succeed the save, they still get hurt going through it. They just know ahead of time that they will get hurt. If they don't succeed, they might start running into it and quickly realize how hazard it is. But just remember, a creature can stop its movement at any point during their turn. So they can just choose to stop as soon as they take damage and not run headlong through the full area of effect. There are a fair few ways a spell can be used. First off, the fact that it makes a 40x40 40 40 area into difficult terrain for up to 10 minutes is rather good on its own. But the fact that it also does 2d4 damage automatically with no saving throws for every 5 feet traveled can be very powerful. See, 4 castle guards you need to take out, place this between you and them, or even directly on them. They now need to take 2d4 damage for every space they move, and at half movement speed. Or if you're being chased through a hallway or corridor, or some sort of area you can funnel enemies through, you can put this spell behind you, slowing or even killing those chasing after you. The best part is if an enemy does not succeed the check or see you cast the spell, they will run 5 feet in, realize that they're hurt, and then run 5 feet out, taking 4d4 damage, and also have you move 20 feet of their movement for that turn because of the difficult terrain. And since it lasts for up to 10 minutes, it can do an insane amount of damage overall, acting as a killing floor of damage of difficult terrain for entire armies. This is the spell to use if you want to completely stop the movement of enemy minions if it doesn't just outright kill them when they move. A spell that does a fair bit of damage on its own is strong, but not the best. One that has utility can be situationally useful, but are usually somewhat niche. But the best spells are the ones that can do both. And this is why Spike Growth is at number one. Alright, and that's the video. This is Editor Selty, and as Hiru, or as we call him here, the D&D Logs, didn't record an outro, it looks like you're stuck with me. But, did we miss anything? Spells that should have been on this list but weren't? I'd love to hear about them, along with ideas for future videos, in the comments down below.